Welcome to Mission Gathering, where all are welcome to Christ's table. If you are Asian, Hispanic, Indian, Indigenous, Black, or White, if you are male or female, trans, intersex, or non-binary, if you are three days old, 30 years old, or 103 years old, if you've never stepped foot in a church, or if you are Buddhist, Roman Catholic, agnostic, or evangelical, if you've never questioned your faith, or if you're tired of and hurt by religion, but you still hold on to Jesus, if you are single, married, divorced, separated, or partnered, if you are straight, gay, lesbian, or bisexual, if you are a Republican, Democrat, Independent, Socialist, or not registered to vote. If you have or had addictions, phobias, abortions, or a criminal record. If you own your home, rent, live with your parents, or are houseless. If you are fully abled, disabled, or a person of differing abilities. You are welcome here. Hey, Mission Gathering. Our next in-person gatherings at our church building are gonna be June 5 and June 19th. And all of June, we're gonna be focusing on Pride Month and celebrating Pride. Um, and we also need your help on June 25th at Pride Fest at Capitol Hill uh, in Seattle. So if you can help us with Pride Fest, sign up by just reaching out to us and letting us know you're interested and we'll give you some more information. We're glad you're here with us today. With the pace of our lives and the intensity of all that's going on in our world all around us, the spiritual practice of checking in with ourselves can be so important. What are we feeling? What are we trying not to feel? So I want to invite you right now to get in a comfortable position as we check in with our physical body and our emotional body. So we'll start with our physical body. And beginning at the top of your head, just notice whatever you're feeling, whatever the sensations are, moving down to your neck, your shoulders, your chest, midsection, your legs, all the way down to the bottom of your feet. And as you sense what you're feeling throughout your body. Bring a gentle, loving, accepting awareness. Direct it to any parts of you that need it and just notice what that feels like. And now we'll do this again, but this time with our emotions, a heart scan. And as we do, just note where these feelings come up in your body and note any additional words or images that come to mind. And the word we'll start with is worry. Not judging, just acknowledging, oh, I'm worried about this or that. And where is it in your body that you might feel that worry? about grief, personal grief, collective grief. We hold so much of what we take in from all that goes on around us. It might even be surprising things that you thought you had already processed that are still there. Again, no judgment, just noticing where does that grief show up for you? How about anger? So often we judge our anger, but right now just allow it, just acknowledge it, just see it. 
What about excitement? Where do you feel that in your body? How about peace? Joy. As you sense what emotions are there for you, bring a gentle, loving, accepting awareness to all of those parts of you and just direct that awareness to whatever part needs it. And remember that next time you feel overcome with an emotion, that you can take a step back and apply love and acceptance and awareness. As someone who tends to numb or push down my own emotions, this heart scan can be a really meaningful spiritual practice for me to help accept and process my own thoughts and feelings. And I really need that right now, um, especially after the last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of grief, sadness, fear, um, two mass shootings, 10 black people killed in Buffalo and three injured, uh, 19 kids, 9, 10, 11 years old, two teachers dead. In 2022, there have been over 200 mass shootings, more shootings than days of the year that have passed. And we hear shouts and posts online that the problem is mental health. And yet I see one politician calling for more mental health services. Uh, the governor of Texas, just last month, he removed $211 million in funding for mental health services. And Texas ranks last in all 50 states for overall access to health care, to mental health care. So is mental health really the problem? And if it is, why are you doing anything about it? Why are you removing access? Or is it a gun problem? Uh, or both, or something else altogether. You know, when this happens, we want to know the why behind it. Uh, you know, now we're finding out there are issues with police waiting so long to enter the school building and the classroom uh, where the kids were. And we're finding out that the white supremacist shooter in Buffalo made contact with a retired law enforcement officer prior to the shooting. So maybe we also have a law enforcement problem. One well-known news outlet released an article this week suggesting that the problem is that kids are turning away from God because they don't have strong Christian fathers. And that's why we have mass shooters. So is the problem that more kids and their fathers aren't Christians? I mean, that's not the case for the Southern Baptist Convention, who this week finally released a list of over 600 cases of sexual abuse by people in their churches. The abusers were Christians. Many of the abusers were Christian fathers. So is that really the problem? I mean, we, we try to find the reason why in these horrible moments, and the, the answers are probably way more complex and multi-layered than anyone wants to really admit. Either way, what I know is we're not doing much to fix the problems. And it's infuriating. And it's exhausting. I mean, where is God in this is a valid question. Uh, you know, why aren't thoughts and prayers working? Um, but I so feel the cry of Jesus on the cross when he quotes um, the ancient psalm of David, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? Why are you so far from helping me? I cry by day, but you don't answer. And by night, but I find no rest. And we need to cry out. We need to cry out in anger and grief. And we need to do that together. And, and we need to remember, this is why we are a, a community. Um, I am grieving with you. You are not alone in your grief. I am angry with you. You are not alone in your anger. I am anxious with you. You're not alone in your anxiety. We grieve together, and I believe that God grieves with us. 
Um, you know, we're crying out to God. How can an all-powerful God do nothing? And maybe God is crying out to us. How can people with such free will and responsibility do so little to stop the suffering? I wonder if God is crying out just as we are. Why? And as this is nothing new. I mean, the ancient prophets really wrestled with this question of prayer in the face of injustice. In Isaiah 1, God says, Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. God says, Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. God says, I'm not listening to your prayers until you stop doing evil and start acting in ways that lead to the flourishing of life. And then let's talk, God says. And James, the brother of Jesus, echoes this idea. He writes in James 2, what good is it to claim that I have faith claim that I'm a Christian if my actions don't match up with my faith. He says, what if a brother or sister comes to you in need of food and clothing, protection, and you say, I'm, my thoughts and prayers are with you. Go in peace. But you do nothing to meet their physical needs. James says that your faith without works, is it's dead. It's completely useless. Thoughts and prayers that don't lead to loving action that resists violence are useless and a waste of time. I do believe that thoughts and prayers, when used to ground ourselves, they, they can lead us to a place where we have some clarity on how to act. It gives us kind of some space to process our emotions. And part of caring for our own mental health, and May is Mental Health Awareness Month, means allowing space to process and observe our own emotions and, and observe them in ways that are non-judgmental. That just accepts, this is where I am, this is how I'm feeling. Um, you practice Jesus' teaching to not judge others by starting with ourselves. Don't judge your own anxiety, your own anger. Have some compassion on yourself. And we need to accept and feel those emotions. Feel the grief, the anger, the confusion. You know, accept the reality that, that you are experiencing these emotions and thoughts. Um, and so often those thoughts and emotions are so appropriate and necessary. Um, and this is where I think prayer as mindfulness can be grounding and helpful because it can help us connect our heart, our emotions to our body. It can help us live out of kind of our deepest values, peacemaking, compassion, love, nonviolence. Um, and thoughts and prayers when directed inward um, can help lead me to see the full picture of reality beyond the lens of all of my thoughts and emotions. So I can then figure out how is the, should I act? How should I vote? How should I reach out to law, lawmakers? How should I offer comfort and protection for people around me, for people in my neighborhood? I think thoughts and prayers when directed inward um, can allow us some stability and clarity to know how we are supposed to actually live in the world. But thoughts and prayers that don't lead to action, like James says, is useless, dead. So, because too often prayers are just empty words by people in power who use them as an excuse to do nothing. And there's a story in Acts 16 where Paul and Silas, or Jesus followers, they're walking down the street and an enslaved woman with a spirit in her is following them and she's shouting and she's following them and shouting for several days and Paul gets so annoyed that he turns around and he demands that the spirit leave her and the spirit within this woman had allowed her to predict the future to know the future so her slave owners were making a profit tons of money off of her ability to predict the future and her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone. 
so they grabbed Paul and Silas and they dragged them into the uh, city center before the officials, law enforcement. They have them arrested. They have them stripped naked. They have them beaten. And then they're thrown in prison. And what's interesting is that the demon, the spirit in the story is not the woman who is shouting. The word for demon in Greek um, means powers. It means both good powers and evil powers. The text doesn't say the spirit that's in this woman is bad or evil. There are other evil demons in this story, powers at work in this story. The evil demons in this story were the men who were exploiting this enslaved girl. That is the evil demon in this story. So the demon are those in power who place prophets above people, who use people and allow them to be put in harm's way in order to make a profit. People who refuse to stop the cycles of violence because money is more important. That is the evil demon in this story. And I think maybe we have a demon in our country. Systems, people, organizations that place profit above people and so often use the argument of freedom, personal freedom, as a cover. We find the demon of that greed within our own hearts. Uh, Reverend Andrew Shipley at Mission Gathering Charlotte wrote a powerful uh, liturgy on freedom. He said, freedom is not owning as many guns as you can afford. Freedom is going to the grocery store or the mall, or your house of worship, a bar, a concert, a movie, to watch game with friends at home, a birthday party, or work without the fear of being gunned down. That's freedom. He says, freedom is being able to pack a school lunch without worrying that it will be your child's last meal. This freedom is sending them off to college and not worrying if they will be alive by Christmas break. Freedom is not cosplaying as a soldier. It is being able to live in peace with your neighbor. So this Memorial Day, may we remember and honor those who lost their lives, striving to build a place where true freedom existed. May we also remember that those who died so often died needlessly because they were part of a system that believed violence and war were the best way. May we recognize that there is still so much work to be done in building a world that is truly free for all people to live, to survive, to thrive. So this Memorial Day weekend, I think we have an opportunity, a responsibility to carry on those, uh, the people's legacy who've lost their lives striving for freedom. We need to carry on that legacy because we have not reached freedom yet. We have so much work to do. But I believe that it's our, our messy togetherness that is really the source of our strength, our hope, and any chance for making change. It is our messy togetherness. We grieve together. We hurt together. We sh become outraged together. And you're not alone in that. And so we've asked God, where are you to be found in all this? And when I look at Christ and, uh, and the suffering that Christ endured, it reminds me that, that God is found, I believe, in every feeling of grief and suffering, in every act of resistance against powers that destroy. God is there. God is found in every act of care towards those whose lives are destroyed by violence. And God is found in you. Well, may our thoughts and prayers actually lead us to action, to do justice. Elise Myers, is a, she's a person who's kind of gone viral on social media, and she really struggles with mental health and depression and anxiety. And she's been very vocal on Instagram about her challenges. And she's gone viral because, one, she's really funny, and people are really finding solidarity and that they're not alone in their feelings of being overwhelmed and their feelings of anxiety. Um, and she offers this solution as a marketing idea for Nike's Just Do It slogan. Um, and it offers a message for us, so take a look. Nike, I need you to listen, listen. 
I have a new campaign idea for you and I think it should just be all across the board everywhere. Just do it scared. Just do it anxious. Just do it tired. Just do it overwhelmed. For people that are just normal people that get really overwhelmed with like normal life, brushing your teeth, putting clothes on, sending an email, making a phone call, actually going to the coffee date that you scheduled. And then you can cut back and forth between like athletes that are like really nervous before a game or really nervous before like a press conference or something that they have to do fancy athlete style, just like, and then cut to a person going at their desk, sending an email. Cause I like wearing Nike. It's like pretty much all I wear on my feet, but I am not an athlete. And I have to just do it scared, but normal person things. That would be incredible and I need you to do this. So I think what God is telling us is enough with thoughts and prayers. Just do it, <laughs> do justice, do love. Cause the fear, the anxiety, uh, the grief, it may not just go away. We may be processing it, we will be processing it in some form or another, our entire human existence. But we have to find a way to keep going together, to act in ways that lead to beauty and life in our lives, in our relationships, in our neighborhoods, in our politics. So just do it, just love. <laughs> even if you're afraid, even if you're anxious, keep getting up in the morning, keep using your voice, we need you, and God needs you to bring healing to this world. So just do it. We do it together. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Open unto me, light for my darkness. Open unto me, courage for my fear. Open unto me, Hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me.